own. <laughs> Good morning. And again, uh, happy Mother's Day. All the mothers out there and all of us uh, who are fortunate enough to have their mothers like myself who's in relatively good health and of course probably sad thoughts for those of us who have lost our mothers. You know, no mother is perfect, but uh, if you survive to adulthood, your mother did her job <laughs> and uh, she deserves your respect and honor on this day. And I'm pointing that finger back at myself. So especially if your mother's alive, give her a call or do something special with her if you can. Well, uh, usually you would hear a traditional Mother's Day sermon, uh, but I'm reminded here at Vandalia, we follow the lectionary. So uh, instead of a sermon that might focus on Jesus at the wedding at Cana, his encounter with his mother there, or the time when Jesus uh, the time when Joseph and Mary lost Jesus when he was 12 years old and they found him at the temple. Uh, usually those are, you know, passages like that are chosen uh, and are the basis for a Mother's Day sermon. Uh, uh, since we're following the lectionary, that, that won't be the case. So I apologize, no traditional Mother's Day sermon. Instead, we're focusing on God and also Jesus as shepherd. And being an Old Testament scholar, I'm going to focus on the Old Testament text, which is the 23rd Psalm. But again, what is said about God also applies to Jesus. So we're going to look at the 23rd Psalm, and I realize it's a very well-known psalm. And if you've ever had to memorize scripture as a child... This is probably one of those passages that you memorized and probably from the King James, the 1611 version. And uh, in, in the world as a whole, uh, this is probably one of the most well-known passages in the Bible ever. Um, during World War I and II, it was common on the lips of soldiers, and it's been a passage of scripture that many people have cherished and recited to themselves during very difficult times. So what I'm going to do this morning, I want to, I want to talk about the type of psalm that the 23rd Psalm is. It's a psalm of confidence. And to do that, we're going to have to look at Psalm 6 briefly. And then I'm just going to very briefly go through the psalm, look at particular phrases, and maybe provide a little bit more illumination for understanding uh, aspects of the psalm that perhaps you haven't heard before, and then um, come to a conclusion. So uh, there are different types of psalms, and uh, the 23rd psalm is called a psalm of confidence. But you can't really understand a psalm of confidence unless you understand um, a lament. So um, I think Psalm 6 is supposed to be available. So this is a short psalm, like the 23rd Psalm, so I'm not going to read it, the whole psalm or anything like that. Uh, but uh, this, the type of psalm this is, is a lament. And when you look at the book of Psalms, the most common type of psalm that you'll find is a lament. Now, a lament is, is basically a cry out to God. So it's a, either an individual or the community cries out to God because of some crisis. And they're trying to get or persuade God to intervene 
in this crisis and deliver them from some threat. And there are different parts of a lament, and, but for a psalm to be a lament, it has to have a petition, which means at some point in the psalm, the psalmist has to ask God directly to intervene. And you see this in the psalm from the get-go uh, in the first few uh, verses. The psalmist says, don't rebuke me. Be gracious to me. And there's, there's complaint mixed in with this petition. Um, he's languishing and he feels God's anger. And then in uh, verse 2, be gracious to me. Heal me. My bones are shaking with terror. Verse 3. Uh, further complaint. And then verse 4, turn, O Lord, save my life, deliver me for the sake of your steadfast love. So in this Psalm 6, there's a cry out to God because of some crisis. Maybe it's an enemy. Maybe it's a sickness. Uh, uh, maybe it's just economic misfortune. Whatever it is, whatever crisis it is, the psalmist is crying out to God, petitioning him to intervene to take care of this problem and bring this psalmist peace. So that's what makes it a, a lament, is that cry of petition, and then it has other parts. But what's interesting is toward the end of the psalms of lament, almost always they end on a positive note, a note of confidence. So when you go to verse 8, through verse 10, right at the end of the psalm, you have that note of confidence in this short psalm. Depart from me, all you workers of evil. For the Lord has heard the sound of my weeping. The Lord has heard my supplication. The Lord accepts my prayer. All my enemies shall be ashamed and struck with terror. They shall turn back and in a moment be put to shame. So at the end of this lament, the psalmist is almost trying to assure himself that God has heard his petition and that he is going to intervene. So there's this note of confidence at the end where the psalmist tries to build up his own confidence, make himself feel consoled, make himself realize that he can depend on God, that God's going to answer his prayer. Now, a psalm of confidence is simply that note just blown up. It's a psalm that totally just focuses on confidence. Even though, so we think that the psalms of confidence actually derived originally from the laments. So now let's go uh, to the 23rd psalm. A psalm of confidence. So now I'm just going to go through and uh, deal with the uh, sections of the uh, psalm and the verses and add a little illumination. Now the superscription that begins the psalm, a psalm of David, um, that's literally what the Hebrew has, but it's very ambiguous. Uh, most people think David himself wrote this psalm that it it means that he's the author of this psalm, but that's very unlikely because at the end of the psalm, in verse 6, there's a reference to the house of the Lord, which, is a, which clearly is the temple. And, of course, David didn't build the temple. The temple was built after his death. So more likely, this little superscription at the beginning of the psalm is saying, this is a psalm dedicated to David, that it's a, a scribe has written this psalm, and he's dedicating it to King David in his honor. Or it could mean that David himself as king authorized this psalm to be written and to be collected. Um, but anyway, the reason why David gets connected with the book of Psalms and gets connected with so many psalms, as you know, is traditionally he's, he plays the lyre or he plays the harp. And we know the story about how Saul was soothed by David's harp. Now, there's a tradition that David was a shepherd in 1 Samuel, but there's also a tradition that he was a trained warrior. And 
he played the harp. And the tradition of him being a trained warrior is connected with the tradition of him playing the harp. And uh, that's a little bit unusual to have a trained warrior who also plays the lyre or plays the harp. It would be like today a high school clarinet player who was simultaneously on the football team. It does happen, but it's unusual. But anyway, David gets connected with the book of Psalms mainly because uh, of that fact that he, he was a musician and he played the harp. It begins with a description as, of the Lord as my shepherd. And in fact, God himself is often described as a shepherd. In Ezekiel chapter 34, verses 11 through 16, God uh, condemns the Israelite leaders who, because of their uh, misleading, their mismanagement of the people, led the people into the Babylonian exile and into disaster. And so God is angry with the Judean leadership. And he condemns them, and he basically says, I'm going to be the shepherd for my people from now on, and I'm going to take care of them as a shepherd. Other passages that describe God as a shepherd are Psalms 28.9, 77.20, and 78.52. And in the ancient Near East, kings were often compared with shepherds. And the reason why they did that is uh, the people wanted their kings to be shepherds and not despots. They wanted their kings to care about them and treat them as if they were his sheep. Now, if you don't mind, could you show the picture of uh, the catacomb? There's a catacomb in Rome where they found this mid-2nd century depiction. You may not be able to see it very well, but this is Jesus as the good shepherd. Uh, so, and he's got a sheep or a lamb uh, over his shoulders. So this psalm is about God, but everything that applies to God, of course, as Christians, we can transfer over to Christ. So we'll do that. So if you can go back to the 23rd Psalm, I'll briefly add a bit of illumination here and there. And by the way, uh, the psalm begins with this image of God as a shepherd, and it continues through the first four verses. And then in verse 5, it changes to the image of God as a gracious host. Now, when I was young, I used to hear sermons on this psalm as if the whole psalm were about God as a shepherd. But that, that doesn't fit. Verse 5 doesn't quite fit the image of, of God as a shepherd, but rather another important role in the ancient world was as a host. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. So every need, the psalmist is saying God supplies. And of course, there's a difference between needs and desires. He makes me to lie down in green pastures and leads me beside the still waters. He's such a good shepherd He's just not, he's not a minimalist shepherd, but he actually leads the sheep to fine pastures, green ones, and not uh, rough water, but still water, where we the sheep can drink. He restores my soul. This is not the Greek immortal soul. In Hebrew, a better translation would be, he restores me, myself. Uh, the Israelites didn't separate the soul from the body, so it, it means the person. He restores me. He leads me in the King James. It has paths of righteousness, uh, which kind of changes the image and enters the realm of morality. But we need to preserve the image of the shepherd and his sheep. And it just means right paths, straight paths. It means safe paths. Lead the sheep along safe paths, not crooked or dangerous paths for his name's sake. God is concerned about his reputation. He always is. And that's especially found in the Old Testament, his honor. And so as a shepherd of his people, he's going to take care of his people. Why? 
because he knows, know, knows that the uh, other peoples of the world are looking and watching, and they're going to see how he treats his own people. And he does everything to protect his own honor and his own reputation. Now, in the King James, it has, even though I walked through the valley of the shadow of death, and in Hebrew, it literally has shadow of death. Um, it's being used metaphorically, not literally. And the way the Israelites viewed death is it was, it was under the ground. And so, like in a tomb. And so it was, it, was, it was the place where there was darkness. It was very, very dark. So death was often used as a metaphor for darkness. So this expression here, even though I walk through the valley of death, it's better translated as the darkest valley, a dark and dangerous ravine. Um, so even though a shepherd might sometimes have to lead the sheep into a dangerous area like that, the psalmist says, we're okay because God is there to protect us. I fear no evil refers to danger that the, sheep's, that the sheep might encounter. My rod and my staff, they comfort me. The rod was a club that was used to drive away wild animals, whereas the staff was a long stick that would support the shepherd as he walked. But what's important is they both could be used as defensive weapons against wild animals that might threaten the sheep. Verse 5 shifts the imagery to God as a gracious host. And uh, that's a part of Texas... Uh, culture, the idea of a host, gracious host, Texas hospitality, or where I'm from in Tennessee, southern hospitality is a big thing. And you've probably heard of Arab hospitality. That's where it comes from. And in an, in an area like the ancient world, in the ancient Near East, where travel was dangerous and where it was often hot and dry and dusty, and we can relate to that, especially now here in Lubbock, People that would open their doors and bring in strangers was, was critical for travel in the ancient world. There were no Holiday Inn Expresses. And so in the ancient world, you were dependent on people that would take you in. And, and, but it was, uh, it was beneficial not only for the guests but for the host because in the ancient world, if you served as a host, your status would increase. Your reputation would rise you would receive honor, and especially the guests would give you that honor. But people, onlookers, would be amazed at uh, uh, your willingness to sacrifice for these strangers. So being a host was a very important part of the ancient world. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. It's interesting, there's a tone of derision here as the psalmist taunts his enemies because they are not able to harm him. Now, mo most of us don't see this image, but what the psalmist is saying is God is like a gracious host and he's taken me in and, and, he's, and as, a, as a good host, he's going to defend me and protect me. And, but he doesn't just do that. He provides this bountiful table full of food Incredible feast. And not only does he do that, but he does it right in the face of my enemies. My enemies are at a distance and they're looking on, but they can't touch me. And I get to eat this wonderful, wonderful food right in front of them, rubbing it in. Now, as Christians, we might have a problem with that sentiment, but that's what the psalmist is trying to convey. God has prepared this table before me in the very presence of my enemies, and they can't touch me. Can't touch me. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. 
not just a minimalist host, but a bountiful host, a gracious host who provides comfort in a dry climate by anointing the head, which was very common, and then a cup that overflows like a, like a waiter or a waitress that just, just keeps coming by and fills up your cup, you'll never run out. It's just uh, an ideal depiction of the perfect and the most gracious host. Now, we don't have the custom of anointing feet and head, but that was the duty of the host. Simon the Pharisee failed to do this in Luke 7 to Jesus. And Jesus pointed it out. Since we don't have this custom, a better translation would be, you welcome me as an honored guest. And then finally in verse 6, this is the conclusion of the psalm, and it begins with surely, where the emphasis is on what follows. The psalmist says, goodness and mercy, or love, would be a better translation. Goodness and love are personified as messengers who accompany the psalmist all the days of his life. And I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. House of the Lord, everyone agrees this refers to the temple, but most likely it's being used metaphorically. It can have one of two meanings. The psalmist is either saying that he's going to worship the Lord in the temple, he's going to frequently come to the temple all the days of his life, or even more metaphorically, he's saying God's presence and power will always be with him. And forever, as the new RSV more correctly translates, this means a long time, as long as the psalmist lives. In conclusion, this psalm intends to build up our confidence in preparation for any crisis that comes our way. It portrays God as a deity who will take care of all of our needs, including defensive ones, physically, spiritually, socially. And this psalm especially aims to help us mentally. We can have high confidence in our Lord, whatever may come.